Tanya Tokacheva, a six-year-old girl, came with her mother and brother to visit her relatives in Moscow. It was the end of June. Other children had been taken away to dachas and pioneer camps, and Tanya was inventing games on her own. Most of all, she liked to ride the elevator, up and down and up. One summer morning, right after breakfast, she went for a walk and didn't come back. Late in the evening, after going around all the yards and entrances, her mother reported her daughter missing to the police. Two more days passed in oppressive expectation, and a faint hope that everything would be all right, that the little country girl was just lost in an unfamiliar city and was about to be found, that if there was any trouble, it was certainly correctable. On the third day, a child's head and right leg were discovered not far from the house, in an abandoned barn. It was what was left of Tanya. And the next day, in an inactive lagoon, located 30 meters from the shed, found the rest of the corpse. A forensic autopsy established that Tanya Tikacheva's death occurred within two to four hours after she had consumed food and two to three days before she was found. This meant one thing. The girl was killed on June 22, around 12 noon. The remains looked strange, not typical for such cases. As the experts determined, the corpse had been washed with water. All the terrible findings, not covered with anything, not wrapped in anything, testified that the killer must be different from ordinary people. In the pocket of the dead girl's dress, they found a watch without glass, a wrapper from a candy summer, and one penny. None of these things did not belong to Tanya. And one more clue for the investigation. Scraps of newspapers on the remains. Bloodstains were clearly visible on the scraps. To determine the names of newspapers, Izvestia and Soviet Russia, and the dates of their publication was not very difficult. And the clue was that Izvestia was not sold in the Shchukinskaya neighborhood at that time so the murderer was most likely a subscriber to this newspaper. The investigation also proceeded from the fact that the criminal lived nearby, worked somewhere nearby, and possibly had a car, and used a garage. And, finally, the version that the murderer had been prosecuted in the past for the rape of minors or suffers from mental disorders was traditionally worked on. Suspects at first there were several hundred, then the circle was narrowed to 47 people, then to 12, and finally remained five men each of whom could be the perpetrator. But none of these people were not involved in the death of Tanya, and the very version of Don Juan's fell away pretty quickly. The search lasted more than six months, says Friedrich Svetlov, until it became clear that the greatest interest is Lavrentiev, closed, secretive, unsociable man, all in himself. He married only at the age of 47. His mother did not allow. We were able to get information that Lavrentiev traveled out of town and engaged in bestiality. We also knew that he would not pass by a girl quietly. He would look back. He lived in the same entrance with Tanya Tikacheva's aunt. He began to feel different early on, different from everyone else. I was afraid of woman, he admits to the forensic psychiatrist. I did not know how to approach. It bothered me. I couldn't afford the things a single man allows himself. My mother objected. She lived alone, my father had left long ago, and was in her fifties. She felt I was suffering and allowed some sexual acts with her. She suggested, come over because it's hard for you to live, unmarried, let me make it easier for you. She said, when you get married, then you'll know, things will get better for you. And things really weren't going well for him. This explained his timidity and indecisiveness in relations with women. In addition, being a religious man, Lavrentiev considered it inadmissible to have an extramarital affair. God will punish, or what? questioned the psychiatrist. Why? You are in vain so, I knew that it is forbidden, took offense Lavrentiev. I had other notions on this matter. Relations with his mother lasted almost twelve years, and then he felt that he began to attract girls. He was not afraid of them, like women. With weak girls to cope, in Lavrentiev's opinion, it was easier. In what did the attraction to girls manifest itself? The psychiatrist asked. I would not say that there was direct sexual excitement, Lavrentiev reasoned, but the desire and pleasantness were there. I would touch the genitals, rub them, and rarely ever put my middle finger in. It was all such a pleasure. There were no normal sexual intercourse. He watched little girls playing squatting for long periods of time. He drew scenes in his imagination, and one day, Walking by the pond, he made up his mind. He spotted a preschool girl in the bushes and proposed, Shall we go? 
I said to her, show me. I must have promised her something, first one girl, then another. The first one runs away. The other one says, okay. She took off her panties. Then she cried out a little. There was blood, and that was the end of it, summarized Lavrentiev. I usually have that, pleasantness. It's like looking at a beautiful picture. He would carpool the girls outside the theater, take two tickets at the box office, and invite them to see a movie. He almost always guessed the one who would agree, go, and not tell anyone. Usually he chose the penultimate morning session and, sitting in a dark, half-empty hall, showed, let me do this at you. The very first teenage girl, snatched by him from the flock of peers at the movies, cynically agreed, give a ruble and with a nipple. After the session, Lavrentiev led the girl to a remote bench, covered her knees with a cloak, which he wore even in warm weather, and received his pleasantness. Other young adventurers themselves invited him to the movies, knowing already from girlfriends about the way to earn a ruble. Lavrentiev realized that his inclination was criminal, but he could not overcome himself. With women, he knew that nothing would work out, but something had to be done, and the only way out of the vicious circle saw him in marriage. I had high hopes that I would get married and stop being a non-human, he said when questioned. His bride was the first adult woman he dared to kiss, but on his wedding night, he failed. It happened again the next night, his wife remained a virgin. Only the third attempt was successful, but for conception is not necessary for a full-fledged sexual intercourse, and in 53, he had a daughter who died during childbirth due to severe pathology. Two years later, there was a boy the same age as Tanya Tikacheva. Alas, the calculation for a normal married life was not justified. Lavrentiev did not feel like a full partner in intimate relations. Even a gentle remark or a wish of his wife, made at the time of intimacy, meant another fiasco. Lavrentiev husband. He went to specialists about impotence, underwent a course of treatment, but all to no avail. And he again began to look at girls. That damn day he woke up with a severe headache. It was Saturday, a short working day. Lavrentiev usually had lunch on duty, but here he decided to go home. In the entryway, he saw a girl. She was obviously a commuter. He opened the door and called out to her. Tanya saw a lot of toys by the window. Lavrentiev's family was at the dacha. No one was at home. Ooh, how many toys? exclaimed the girl. He meanwhile, having taken off his cloak, was watching Tanya's movements. And she, feeling an incomprehensible uneasiness, began to walk away. She bent over for some reason, hesitating for a moment, and Lavrentiev, who kept his eyes on her, saw the child's bare foot. He felt a thrill, for the sight of a child's foot had always had such an effect on him. Did you want to have sexual intercourse with her? He was asked at the inquest. Yes, I wanted to, he answered. But when I begin to worry, I already lost all excitement. I dragged her into the bathroom. She began to scream. At that time, I was completely unaware of what I was doing. I already had no desire. I don't know why I started to put her in the bathtub. She was struggling and didn't want to be put down. Why did she fight? I don't know if she was afraid or what. Only I had this hand over her mouth and this hand between her legs. When she calmed down, I took my hands away and saw that she wasn't moving. She was dead. I must have unconsciously put my hand over her mouth. I held her tight. There was a little bit of blood at the bottom of the tub, about the size of a spoon. And just like that, her fingers were covered in blood. I was struck by this death. The door to the bathroom was open. There was a murderous silence in the apartment. The light was on. Lavrentiev looked at the girl once more. She was lying in the same position. He turned on the water and went into the kitchen to get a knife. He took the one he usually used to cut bread with and went back to his victim, dissected the dead body, washed the knife, took out a cardboard box and put the severed head and foot in it. Almost uncovered, he carried the box out of the driveway. It was dusk, neither day nor night, according to Lavrentiev. He encountered no one along the way. There was no deep night, Lavrentiev said at the interrogation. I was walking at a light hour. Apparently the box became heavier and I was tired. Nearby was a temporary structure, a pumping station there without a door, without everything. There was a pit. There was water glistening. 
Into this pit I lowered the corpse, without covering it with anything. He returned home and boxed up what was still left in the bathtub. He acted as if half asleep. On the one hand he remembered some details, but on the other hand, his consciousness refused to perceive what he had done. There was a corpse, which should be removed, and why he appeared there, Lavrentiev was as if unaware. The next day he went to visit his wife and son at the dacha. He looked sick and broken. He did not say a word about what had happened. He could trust only the Almighty and, standing at home in front of the icon of Nicholas the Wonderworker, prayed for forgiveness. Only a monster could do such a thing, Lavrentiev repeated, when he, among many others, was summoned to the police on the fact of the girl's murder. Later, when he encountered familiar operatives on the street, he would extend his hand to greet them. Until one day that hand hung in the air, he did not know that the police sieve, diligently sifting through all the unnecessary, left at the bottom, only him alone. The investigator issued an arrest warrant, says Friedrich Svetlov, and we thought about where to detain the criminal. It was dangerous to take him out of the entrance in handcuffs. They wouldn't take him to Petrovka alive. We detained him in a deserted place when he was walking to work in the afternoon. He held out his hand to me, and I said sharply, I don't greet murderers. A few days later Lavrentiev gave detailed testimony. He fully recognized himself guilty of Tanya's death, although he said that he did not want to kill her. Friedrich Svetlov recorded all his interrogations on a tape recorder, although at that time the testimony thus obtained could not be attached to the case. The day of the trial was approaching. Lavrentiev wrote a long letter to his wife, the essence of which was that he was not guilty of the death of the child, but was forced to take on someone else's grave sin. The lawyer did not hand over the letter to the appointed counsel, but read it out in court, immediately questioning the experience and qualifications of the expert. The court sent the case for further investigation. From his cell, Lavrentiev wrote a complaint to the prosecutor as if he had been subjected to unauthorized methods of investigation. There were threats to kill his son. The case reached the Minister of Internal Affairs. And here the tape recordings of interrogations, which did not contain threats, helped. And the repeated commission examination confirmed the conclusions drawn by the expert. It was the knife seized from Lavrentiev that dismembered Tanya's body. A corpse is like daily soup. The longer it lies there and deteriorates, the better it becomes. You can't comprehend it just like that. You have to taste it," Mikhail Novoselov said during questioning. Have you ever had intercourse with a six-year-old girl who had been lying dead in the sun for two or three hours? Novoselov asked the investigator bluntly and casually. The question left the investigator surprised and speechless. As befitting a maniac of his caliber, M. Novoselov was accidentally apprehended, for no apparent reason. In Dushanbe's Central Park, he attempted to steal an air rifle from a shooting range and was caught red-handed at the scene. The thief was taken to a pre-trial detention center and a routine criminal case was being prepared. Then, unexpectedly, a call came in from fellow operatives in a neighboring district. Do you have Novoselov? Keep an eye on him. We're sending a team. What have you done? Detention center staff asked Novoselov. I borrowed a couple of sacks of Uruk from my neighbors, he replied nonchalantly. A few days later, it was revealed that Novoselov was responsible for three murders with rape in Tajikistan. Almost immediately, more on the reasons for his unprecedented candor later, the detainee confessed to three additional murders in Tajikistan and 16 in Russia. The investigative team, with the assistance of experts, began exhuming the remains of children at the burial sites indicated by Novoselov. The geographical scope of Novoselov's crimes extended from Udmurtia to Siberia. I'm a traveler by nature, he remarked during another interrogation. He was a remarkably talkative maniac. The world has turned bitter. Everyone has become callous, cruel, like animals. They'll kill over a ruble. Is that normal? Why did I kill? It wasn't out of malice. I desired a sexual life. What am I supposed to do if I'm only skilled with dead bodies? He questioned. Indeed, he would consistently return to the scene of the crime two or three hours later. You're a necrophiliac? They accused him. Uh, no, I'm a rebel, he retorted, and began reciting Omar Khayyam, 
quoting quatrains about rebels. He had three names, three passports, and three lives. He assumed the identities of Novoselov, Svetlov, and Shakhraziev as the situation warranted. His documents were scrutinized multiple times. Everything appeared legitimate. He would be Russian when required, and when needed, he would adopt a distinctive accent. A professional photographer, artist, painter, and geologist, he possessed credentials for all these fields, which helped him greatly when making acquaintances. Young lady, your facial features are incredibly expressive. Have you ever done a magazine shoot? A brief stroll and a casual chat? And then an iron clamp around the neck as a final act. Novoselov committed his first crime at the age of 17. He had an argument with two men, pulled out a knife, and cut them, though not fatally. He sat down, walked away. It didn't even leave a lasting memory, who wouldn't? The turning point, or stroke of fate as he philosophically called it, came later, after his initial imprisonment sometime in the 80s. After saving up money and mustering the courage, Novoselov decided to engage the services of a prostitute. He chose a more attractive one for an entire night. However, she left him within 20 minutes, laughing and advising him to buy a small jack. The sound of her laughter in that word, not even Jack, but Zaleska, a diminutive term for Jack, still echoed in his ears. They might have been the catalyst. Sometime later, while in the town of Tchaikovsky, Perm region, he killed a girl near a restaurant. Yet, he didn't rape her immediately. He was afraid. When he returned two hours later, he touched the cold body and realized that he had to. Above all else, Novoselov appears to enjoy philosophizing on various topics or indulging in world conclusion, as he referred to his highly intellectual thought process. He could engage in hours-long debates about what constitutes evil and who is to blame. He could dissect Gorbachev and Perestroika, the latest amnesty, and the moral and ethical character of pre-trial detention center personnel. This philosopher adhered to a standard murder scheme, a blow with a heavy object to the head or back of the head, followed by a clamp around the neck and strangulation. He only deviated from this method once when he killed two young children, a boy and a girl. He stabbed them with a sharply honed electrode, which he had concealed beneath his bicycle's saddle. He disposed of their bodies in a ditch, remembering to retrieve the gum he had bought for the boys from their pockets. I intended to give it to someone else, he explained. The ages of his victims ranged from six years old to nearly fifty. He was particularly fond of young boys, killing and raping them. If something about an adult woman displeased him while staying overnight in a cottage, he would deal with her too. After the murder, he wasn't hesitant to rummage through their pockets, taking even small items like handkerchiefs and powders. He had been incarcerated and released multiple times. He received a maximum sentence of 15 years, but due to an amnesty or good behavior, he was released early. While in prison colonies and later in freedom, he painted commissioned pieces, landscapes, swans on ponds, and groups of children playing by streams. He was a skilled artist who poured his soul into his work. He always tried to treat people compassionately, which often earned him the privilege of staying overnight, making acquaintances, receiving meals, and even obtaining clothing for his journey. In a psychiatric hospital in a district of Dushanbe, where he spent around six months, he was spoken of with a unique, reverential warmth. He was perceived as a profoundly decent and intelligent man, with a rich inner world. Calculating him proved difficult, hindering the establishment of a pattern in his murders. His presence in his hometown of Sarapul, Udmurtia, had long been forgotten, and little was remembered about him in other places he had temporarily resided. His mother had long considered him missing. Years had passed without a word from him. Gone. Vanished dissolved. Before his second stint in prison, Novoselov once asked his wife to call the police. She was alarmed. Why? I have a lot to tell them, he grinned. In the end, the police arrived and took him away, and shortly afterward, he received a sentence. However, it wasn't for his murders but rather for escaping from a settlement colony. Back then, I didn't have the courage to confess, Novoselov admitted. I couldn't. In the colony where I was imprisoned, I wanted to write a confession a couple of times, but who knows? Perhaps my will was weak. So, I remained silent. This time, the philosopher wasn't lying. It was pointless now. It's clear, Novoselov stated. Under Tajik laws or Russian ones, that's it, I've had enough. 
Sitting in his detention center cell, Novoselov requested permission to draw something bright and cheerful on the wall. Swans on a pond, a group of boys. His request was denied. Mikhail Moskalev was born in Grodno, Belarus, in 1970. When he was tried in Obninsk for one crime, it turned out that it was the last in a series of crimes committed earlier. Fatal for Moskalev was the midnight of October 7, 1990, when a police patrol detained him in an underground passage with a kitchen knife, which an hour earlier had been stabbed in the chest of a resident of Obninsk, Shirokovsky. Moskalev had met fireman Shirokovsky by chance in a station cafeteria in Kaluga, claiming to be a tourist. In fact, he was in hiding, having come from Grodno after the murder of the 10th grader Ira Kulakova. Shirokovsky invited the sociable tourist to his home in Obninsk. When all the guests had left, his acquaintance Tanya L. came to the host. They secluded themselves in one of the rooms. After a while, Moskalev began to rush in. As soon as the landlord opened the door, Moskalev pushed him into the bathroom and began to strangle him from behind with his hands, then stabbed him in the chest with a knife taken from the kitchen. Shirokovsky was bleeding, and Tanya rushed to his aid. And then, as both of them testified at the interrogation. Moskalev underwent a transformation. He became furious. He grabbed two kitchen knives in his hands and shouted at them not to move, that he was a nightmare killer, that he had two corpses hanging on him in Grodno, and he had nothing to lose. Those froze in horror. Moskalev grabbed the girl, and holding a knife to her neck, tore off her gold earrings and demanded that she undress. Further, threatening to kill her, he raped the girl, while committing a number of actions, which then Senior Counselor of Justice N.P. Osipov called pretentious, and which were repeated by Moskalev when attacking other victims. Here, at Shirokovsky's apartment, Moskalev cut the waistband of Tanya's underwear, putting in it a certain symbol of power triumph over the defeated victim. When Moskalev left the room, he found that the wounded Shirokovsky had disappeared. Then he dragged Tanya out into the street in her shirt, saying that the police would soon come here. Threatening to kill her, he raped her again, taking her to the drying room of one of the houses in the neighborhood. On the way to Obninskoya station, in an underground passage, Moskalev was detained on the basis of the signs that Shirokovsky had managed to give. Later, Osipov and other members of the investigation team went to Horodna to investigate the identity of the person under investigation and his past record of offenses. They interviewed hundreds of people, including Moskalov's school and vocational school classmates. A huge amount of materials was lifted, including the birth record, where there was important information for the investigation. His mother gave birth to Misha at the age of 17 without a husband. Medical examination showed that Moskalev had a skull tattooed on his arm and a winged cupid in his groin. He generally liked to decorate his clothes with frightening signs, skeletons, skulls, grinning faces of animals, wore a bracelet made of razor blades. Belonging to the category of cool in itself does not say anything yet. Thousands of teenagers are fond of these attributes, but their excesses do not go further than noisy gatherings at concerts of idols and fights. With age, this childish disease of excitement from scarecrows comes to naught. Moskalev more and more seriously entered into the layer of these afterlife versus superhuman fetishes, fantasies, and allegories. He thought himself not a louse like everyone else, but one who had the right. He went to the bodybuilding section, pumped up his muscles, cultivated the cult of strength in himself, got a high from the feeling of superiority. He was especially proud of his ruthlessness. There is an episode in the case as he snatched a kitten from the hands of an old lady near the entrance and before her eyes with a smile smashed its head against the wall, and when the old lady screamed, hit her. When the investigators, having arrived in Rodna, began to dig his past, they found two unsolved murders, very similar in execution. In the first case, Tatsiana Lisai, 25 years old, was found dead in the dormitory room of the shoe factory, Neiman. Her two-year-old son was crying over his mother's corpse. It happened in August 1990. The day before, Moskalev had been here with witnesses. He had brought drinks. Tanya was found in the toilet with a cord cut from an electric iron around her neck. Her entire face and body were bruised from fist blows. The bodily injuries had the character of torture with particular cruelty, 
and were committed in the presence of a child. On the victim were found traces of strangulation, committed in a special way. Moskalev, as it would later turn out, had repeatedly used this method to bring his victims into an asphyxial state, in which a half-living, helpless victim could do whatever the rapist intended. It is not known how long it would have taken to learn about the tragedy if the boy had not been crying and pulling the doorknob for almost 24 hours after the incident. The expert examination revealed that the victim's suicide had been staged, and her death had not been caused by a spur, but by mechanical asphyxia as a result of her neck being squeezed by her hands. Moskalev immediately came to the attention of the investigation, but he miraculously managed to mislead the investigation. Moskalev dumped on another person, turned away from all tricks of the investigation, and at the end of August of the same 1990, was released from custody. Since the sexual intercourse and bruises could not be denied, Moskalev explained it by the fact that the victim was a masochist, herself asking to beat her to get more sexual pleasure. A week and a half after Moskalev was released, on September 5, 1990, in the same Grodna, at about midnight on a vacant lot, an unknown person attacked Sosnovskaya N.A., 28 years old, a kindergarten teacher at Himvolokno with the purpose of raping and killing her, from the protocol. He grabbed the victim from behind by the neck with his hands, squeezing her throat so that she became unconscious. The victim resisted as best she could when she regained consciousness, and the rapist beat her with his fists and inflicted severe bodily injuries on her face and body, having the character of special torment. Natalia Sosnovskaya was rescued by a couple who happened to be walking along the path. The rapist was forced to run away. The woman went to the police and gave the attacker's description. She especially remembered the lightened, bleached hair, hawkish nose, a frown, speech with an accent, either Ukrainian or Belarus Ian. She would have recognized this man out of a thousand who had said to her, Will you report me to the police? They'll find you dead here in the morning. But the investigation yielded nothing. Three weeks later, on October 1st, 1990, the corpse of Ira Kulikova, 15 years old, a 10th grade student, was found with signs of violent death. The corpse was found on the roof of the elevator shaft of the building where M. Moskalev lived in his mother's apartment. And in the same morning, Moskalev disappears from Grodno, gets on the train, Warsaw, Moscow, to appear in Obninsk five days later, on October 6, 1990, and organize a bloody massacre at Shirakovsky's apartment. When Shevchenko, Osipov, and their assistants began working with Moskalev, the investigation spun faster, more productive. Natalia Sosnovskaya identified Moskalev, who attacked her on the vacant lot. Then, all Moskalev's previous denials about the deaths of Tanya Lisai and Ira Kulikova fell. After the investigation conducted a lot of expert examinations, carefully organized the collection of materials, and built a system of investigative experiments. After the results of expert examinations in the Lisai case, Moskalev himself called the investigator with a note and made a confession to the murder. The investigator established the presence of identity in the method of killing Lisai, Kulakova, as well as in attempts to strangle Shirakovsky and Tanya L. And the most subtle thing, in almost all cases, the perpetrator committed, mocking the victim, fancy actions, the manner of which was caught and brought to a common denominator. Both in Lisai and in other cases, as already mentioned, the perpetrator cut the underwear with a knife, cutting off other details of the toilet. He also liked to lie in a bathtub with pine extract for hours afterward. This was Moskalev's handwriting, irrefutably shown in the murder and rape of Ira Kulikova. Ira lived as a girl, a schoolgirl, was friends with boys and girlfriends, dreamed of becoming a teacher in the elementary grades. In volume 8, there is a statement about the deceased. She never expected evil from people, believed that all people are kind. She was puny, 45 kilos. And one day, the girl went with her friends and acquaintances to the Neyman embankment, to the old wharf, where a certain young man, who called himself a customs lieutenant of the railway station of Grodno, wandered in for nothing. He was handsome, well-built, pumped up, but he looked frowning and sort of half-turned away. Around midnight, the lieutenant stopped a cab near the Palace of Culture of Textile Workers, promising to take Ira home, and in front of the whole company put her with him. Two friends, having seen, ran to the car, but did not have time. Five meters away from them, the cab started, taking Ira to her final destination, and what happened next was terrible. 
Moskalev led Ira to the roof of his 12-story building and pounced on her. The scene keeps traces of desperate resistance. The maniac eased his soul with monstrous cruelty, and at the end he saved strangulation and a stab in the chest, after which he received the rapture. Later, when a knife with traces of Irina's blood, as well as her bloody jeans, jacket, and sweater, are found in his mother's apartment, in the basement of the same building, Moskalev will state at the interrogation on November 1st, Regarding the murder of Kulakova, I can report that I was psychologically attuned to this murder. I needed a release. Kulakova was caught, and I killed her. From the forensic biology report, the separation of the toe parts of both stockings of pantyhose occurred partly from the impact of a cutting object. Fresh ruptures of the hymen and traces of male semen were found. Moskalev's case, in connection with the collapse of the USSR, also sort of disintegrated into separate sovereign territories. All the episodes related to Grodno were transferred to Belarus. The Obninsk Brigade was left with only the Russian episode of the stabbing of Shirokuski. And suddenly, when everything seemed to be coming to an end, a red, small atlas of the USSR, belonging to Moskalev, was found in Shirokovsky's apartment behind the kitchen cupboard. Its belonging to Moskalev was irrefutably proved by the notes on the free of text places and many other things. But the most sensational thing was that on the maps, Moskalev's hand had drawn lines of roots and near the names of settlements, Grodno, Ivi, Baranovici, Oshmiani, etc. There were big and small crosses. There was such a cross on Kaluga. Between Kaluga and Obninsk, there was a big dot in the form of a grave. What is it? A scheme of the murders he committed or only planned? Or is it a wild delusion, inflamed fantasies of black inspiration? At interrogations established only that in some labeled cities, Moskalev was on business trips. Moskalev was sentenced to capital punishment for a series of robberies, rapes, and brutal murders.